Hello, thank you so much for joining us and for viewing this edition of the program for the celebration of Excellent Youth Outreach. If you want to be a partner, please contact the number on the screen. If you also want to have EYO in the campus that you, are, you find yourself in, in Ghana, contact that number below. If you also want to have EYO in the country from where you are watching this, please contact this number also below. And I tell you, we would be ready and apt to listen to your needs and come to your aid. We want many young people to be blessed and want you to come along and help us be that blessing to this generation. God bless you so much. Hello, thank you so much for joining us and for viewing this edition of the program for the celebration of Excellent Youth Outreach. If you want to be a partner, please contact the number on the screen. If you also want to have EYO in the campus that you, are, you find yourself in, in Ghana, contact that number below. If you also want to have EYO in the country from where you are watching this, please contact this number also below. And I tell you, we would be ready and apt to listen to your needs and come to your aid. We want many young people to be blessed and want you to come along and help us be that blessing to this generation. God bless you so much. I trust you are doing good and are being blessed by the Ministry of Excellent Youth Outreach. I encourage you to support us or be a partner by filling the form in the description. God bless you. All right, good evening, everyone. If you are joining us um, for the first time, welcome to Stride. Stride um, is a series of capacity building webinars as, which have been organized as part of EYO's 25th anniversary celebrations. And the purpose is to educate, inspire, and equip. And in that spirit of education and equipment and inspiration, We've had a stride for leadership and governance. We've had also one for business and the economy. And today we are on education, education. So this is very important to us and we are glad to be here. We also have with us a group of very wonderful and well-educated, inspired people to also talk to us about this pillar of society. So without much ado, with um, an opening prayer, I'll say an opening prayer, and after that, I'll introduce my panel. I know we cannot wait to hear um, from the panel, but I'll pray first, and I'll introduce them, and they can speak to us. Shall we share a word of prayer? Father, we thank you so much for Stride once again. We thank you for the opportunity to influence our societies and to influence the world. We thank you today as we discuss education, we pray that your spirit will be with us and to lead us and to guide us and to lead us to say the things that you want everyone to hear. When your people come to speak, it is not because they have something to say, but it's because you have something to tell the rest of your people. Therefore, God speak through us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm, 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 I'm really Amen. excited to be the one to um, moderate this 
stride, particular stride series. And um, it's because um, I'm someone who loves education myself. And I'm currently sojourning in a foreign land, Obi Maiso, mm. because of education. And so um, it's, 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 it's such an important topic to me because I believe in the importance of education. So I left my own family and everybody to come to the United States to study. So without much ado, our panelists, I will start with Mrs. Linda Enima Gatti. Mrs. Linda Enima Gatti is a director of Rohia Foundation Ghana, which is an NGO which seeks to help less privileged children in society by offering spiritual, financial, educational, and emotional support. She holds a bachelor's degree in financial, in French, sorry, in French and linguistics from the University of Ghana, Legon, and a postgraduate diploma in education. She has 10 years experience in both Cambridge and American curriculum. Currently, she is a teacher, a volunteer teacher at Kids at Heart International School. She is happily married to the Reverend Ebo Gatti, and the Lord has blessed them with three wonderful children. Mrs. Enima Gatti, welcome. Thank you. Next, we have with us Dr. Daniel Opoku. Dr. Opoku is a professor in engineering. In the US, we call our lecturers professors. So he's a professor in engineering and he obtained his first degree in electrical and electronic engineering from the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in 2007. He then pursued a PhD program in the United States and graduated with a PhD in electrical engineering in 2013. He was also a doctoral research assistant from 2008 to 2013. And he was a postdoctoral associate researcher from 2013 to 14 at the Autonomous Control and Information Technology Center, which is a technology research laboratory at the North Carolina A&T State University. He has led the Compton Ghana Integrated Limited team of consultants to execute a number of projects successfully. He has been the team lead for the past two and a half years. And Dr. Opoku is currently a member of the management team for the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology Engineering Education Project, which is part of the World Bank's Africa Center of Excellence for Development. Excellence for Development Impacts in the College of Engineering, KNUST. Dr. Poku was appointed as a lecturer of KNUST from November 2016 and serves in that capacity to date. As a dynamic lecturer, he has taught various courses, supervised award-winning student research projects, and he has also served in various committees and is currently the chairman of the Unity Hall Fellows Welfare Committee. He is also a member of the College of Innovation Center Committee. Dr. Daniel Opoku, you are welcome. Thank you very much. We have with us, last but not the least, Dr. Yvonne Lamte. Dr. Yvonne Ayaki Lamte, BSc MPhil from the University of Ghana. She holds a BSc MPhil for University of Ghana and a PhD from Swansea University, Wales, UK. She's a senior lecturer with the Department of Organization and Human Resource Management of the University of Ghana Business School, which is my alma mater. She supervises dissertations, tutor students, and serves as the senior tutor at the Volta Hall of Residence of the University of Ghana. She also serves on various committees within the University of Ghana. Dr. Lamte is a professional member of the Institute of Human Resource Manage Management Practitioners, Ghana, 
and was affiliated to the Chartered Institute of Personnel Development with considerable teaching and practice experience across local and international organizations in Ghana, in US and across Africa. Dr. Lamte's research focus is on employment relations. She also wears um, some hats in strategic human resource management and organizational behavior. She has published in international peer review journals on union relations, organizational behavior, corporate leadership, and the informal sector. She is currently the head of missions and evangelism at her church, where she also teaches the youth and adult Bible study. Her passion is evangelism and teaching. Dr. Yvonne Ayaki Lamte, you are welcome. So today's conversation, like I said, I promise you it's going to be very beautiful and wonderful. It's on education. I want to ask our panelists, could we hear a brief comment from you on why you think education is an important pillar of society? We'll start with the, um, Mrs. Gatte, then we'll go to Dr. Opoku, and then Dr. Lamte would also answer for us. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you for the opportunity to also join in to share my views on education. When we talk about pillars, we all know that pillars give support to a building or it holds a building in place. So if we talk about education being a pillar, that means education plays a role in the society. Education is the transfer of knowledge virtues, attributes, and skills from one person to the other. And that could be done both formally and informally. So it could be done in an institution or even at home, right from home, the, the education we learn or we get from our parents. So if we say it's a pillar in a society, it means it holds the society in place. Without it, everything will crumble down. Imagine I know it all and I die today without teaching another person. It means I'm carrying everything to the grave. So what happens to the next generation? So I feel that education is a very important pillar in the society because it holds the society together and it carries on the society to the next generation. Thank you. All right, Dr. Opoku. Dr. Opoku, you are muted. Thank you very much. I'm also excited to be part of this discussion and to share my ideas on education. Yes, I believe that as she defined, um, when you talk about the pillars of society, you are talking about the things that hold society together. And as we know, education is um, a process of um, acquisition of knowledge. Um, it is also facilitation of learning. So through education, we impart knowledge, we impart values, we impart um, virtues, and so many other things. And whatever we impart to people or the next generation is what determines how they behave. And so if we train people or we give people bad um, impartation, then they are definitely going to um, tear society apart. So it is important and it's part or it's, the, it's one of the pillars because when we, through education, impart good knowledge to um, our subjects, we are prepping them to hold society together and to behave in a way that ensures cohesion and help society to move on from one generation to another without being destroyed. So that is why I believe education is very important. And like she highlighted, Education um, encompassing both the formal and the informal sector um, becomes very crucial because parents at home um, educate their kids. Um, they teach them about society, culture, life skills, um, how to relate to people, mannerism and all that. And then in school, we teach people about um, technology in, through formal education, even how to use technology, how to, um, develop those skills that you need for the 
um, employment that you or your career. So all these things are very important because at the end of the day, they impact the way people behave in society and the way they are able to um, move on with their lives and therefore interact with other people. Yes. Okay. So, so far, before Dr. Lamte comes in, um, we've heard that education is not only formal education, we should also be considering informal education, like Mrs. Gatte said, because education, it's also one of the vehicles by which one generation passes on its learnings to the next generation. And this, I think, is one of the key things that I am taking away from this. And from what you said, Dr. Koko, education is also one way in which society can be cohesive and also advance by learning, which is, which is, which is quite um, important for us as well. So Dr. Dr. Lamte, can we hear from you why you think education is an important pillar of society? Right, okay. Um, thank you very much. I believe that education is important because um, we know through education, we do through education, you can only receive through education. It is when you learn that you receive um, um, knowledge. So as long as knowledge is needed to be able to progress, to move, to improve society, then it makes education important. And so then that becomes a foundation upon which we can become better, we can grow, we can improve. And so that makes it relevant or important for society, those in society to have education. And now education abounds, so it becomes important that knowledge abounds. So it becomes important that we get education and get that knowledge to be able to um, fit into our world today, to be wow. able to fit yeah. into society today. Okay. Wow, that's, that's, that's very, very important. Um, so Dr. Lemte, let me, let me have um, a bit of a follow-up on, on, on that. So um, one, one of the things that you did talk about is that knowledge really abounds. So education is important for mm -hmm. us to um, across some of this knowledge. But you know, sometimes in, in, in a, I mean, I've been in some Christian organizations and some around Christians who actually think that education is not that important so far as you are in the house of the Lord. You know, how, how will you answer those people? All right. Um, so the word of God tells us that um, in one of the parables, it says, Jesus says, um, give the parable, and then the owner of the business says, uh, do business till I come. Jesus says, do business till I come. If you have to do business, you have to learn to do business. And then it means that you need education. If you need to be able to know all the aspects of business, so um, Dr. Poku is into electrical um, engineering, um, Mrs. Gate is into education, I am also into another aspect of education. We couldn't be doing this without learning. And so it is important that if you want to do business and as children of God, if we want to do God's business right, we need to be educated. So education is important. And now the word of God tells us that knowledge will abound. So now knowledge is very available highly available at the reach of the click of a button. So if we need to learn and to keep up, then it means that we need to get education. And that is what society is looking for. Educated people who can apply knowledge. Education is important and we can't do what we have to do or create the impact we should be creating if we don't get knowledge. All right, um, you want to add anything to that question, Dr. Poku? Well, I, I think that we take our inspiration from the Bible. And mm -hmm. if you go through the Bible, um, the people that we follow went through education. I mean, starting all the way, um, even uh, with Moses, who made great impact, he had to go through the system of education in those times mm -hmm. in Pharaoh's house. Um, you can fast forward, you come to Daniel, um, Daniel was part of the people who were selected by Nebuchadnezzar to go through education, okay? Um, they were educated, even though they were not being educated. I don't think Daniel was there to be educated um, in the, about the things of the Bible. 
okay? Mm -hmm. Because they didn't believe even in the Bible. But you see that his understanding of how things work in the society contributed to the way that he was able to impact that society. Because most often people are not able to impact people because they don't have, they don't understand the systems they are working with. Physical mm -hmm. systems, I mean. Um, you go to Jesus. When Jesus came and um, he wanted the disciples to carry the mantle after he has left, he did not just meet them one day and say, hey, go and preach. Okay, he took them through training. So mm -hmm. he, he was with them, educating them for a long time, both using um, miracles, using practical instances, case study, and even teaching through parables and all that. Jesus educated the people he wanted to hold the mantle. Okay, and then one of the people we talk about a lot is Paul, you know, and Paul was very educated. So you could see Paul engaging people on all fronts. When you talk about apologetics, Paul was great. He, he debated the people, he reasoned with them. He, he was able to make great impact and write all these letters that even up to now, as Peter says, we cannot even understand some of the words, all because he had been educated. Okay, so I will not say education would take the place of our spirituality, but definitely it adds something to the way that we are able to use the religion um, and the beliefs we have to impact society because through education, we come to understand the systems we are working with physically, and that helps in our spiritual impact also. Wow, this, this is this is an eye opener and this is really inspiring. And Mrs. Lamte, I'll, I'll just um, take um, your contribution as well before we move to the next question. All right, so um, I believe that education is important. We can't do without it. Otherwise, um, we won't belong here, we won't fit here. Um, as long as there is knowledge, as long as we need to create impact, we need to learn and we can only get the learning through education. And um, I would um, agree with Mrs. Gatte that it comes in various forms, in diverse forms. It's formal, it's informal, it's apprenticeship, it is mother to child nurturing and grooming. So when we are talking about education, it is not just the knowledge or the book, it is also behavior. It is mm. also attitude. It mm. is also grooming in, uh, 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 as a whole because you need to learn how to talk. You need to learn what to say. At what time is it appropriate? Even when you have the knowledge, how do I apply it? In which context is this suitable, right? So um, education is important because we need to learn all these things. And we can only get it from all the aspects. There's no one person who would say, um, I go to school, I get A's, I get a first class, so I am educated. Your mother nurtured you, society nurtured you, some teacher might have disciplined you along the way. Um, you went to church, you were told that what you said was wrong, apologize. All these come together to make us grow and fit in. So mm. education is a total phase mm. that we need to consider. It doesn't just happen in school. School is important. It doesn't just happen in home. Home is important. It doesn't just happen in church. Church is important. They all bring together the contributions or the um, what they teach us for us to become holistic people. Wow. We've, we've audience and those listening, those watching us, you've heard from the panelists, education is a holistic transformation of the individual. And as believers to influence society, we must get it from school, from church, from society, we must learn and become people who know. I think that somebody once said that the, the quote, Jack of all trees, master of none, is actually a misquote because the, what the person was actually saying was that jack of all trades, master of one, and one being the Bible. So as a believer, you must be a master of the Bible, but you must be a jack of everything, not a little bit of everything. And you that is what education seeks to do. It brings transformation to your life. This is, we could go on on this question, but we need to move on to other ones. This is so insightful. I'm so 
much educator on this one. So let me ask from the panelists and then um, I'll start with Dr. Opoku. What led you into education? What, what led you into this career and what was your motivation? So this question is threefold. The first one is what led you into education? What was mo your motivation? And if what do you have for those of us who also want, who aspire to get into education? What should be our priorities? And after that, Mrs. Gatte will, will take it before Dr. Lanta can say. Thank you very much. Um, for me, I believe education is my passion. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, from right from early age, I love to teach my colleagues. Okay, I, I love the idea that I'm able to transfer what I know and the understanding I have to other people and mm -hmm. make them better in some aspect of their lives. And so right from early time, from even after junior high school, I love to go back to my school and interact with the students. Um, after senior high school, I went into teaching. And then of course, after university, I was a teaching assistant because I just love to teach. Mm -hmm. And then after that, in fact, I had opportunity to work. I've had opportunity to work in some fields that people love to, um, but always my key thing has been education because I feel like it's one of my passions or in fact, my ultimate passion is to teach. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so when I got the opportunity to work with Shrombaje, with Huawei, I still left it to go for uh, my PhD because I wanted to teach. And um, in US, when I finished, I worked for about two um, postdoc, and then I worked in a company for two years, and I still wanted to teach. Okay, mm. so I just left, and then I came back to Ghana and enrolled in my alma mater as um, a lecturer. So for me, it's a passion. And what is my motivation? Again, the fact that education brings people together, the young minds, open minds, willing to learn, willing to be trained. And so I see it as a platform to actually impact society and to help people to execute, in fact, the things that you alone cannot execute. So I can transfer my passion to other people and then they can use that to better society. So for me, my greatest motivation is to see my students doing well. And I keep telling them, if, if we want money, we will not come here because uh, the greatest motivation as a teacher or lecturer, they always say our rewards are in heaven. It's not money, okay? So my greatest motivation is to see the knowledge transfer accomplished and the students doing well. Um, they leave and they get work, they get into other um, uh, higher learning and they give you updates and you are happy, okay? And especially when I'm even able to facilitate some students into getting scholarships outside or even inside, I'm very happy because I see them also getting closer to their ambitions and their passion. And so I think my motivation really is to see the students doing well, okay? And those who want to come into that field, I'll say that, uh, let not your motivation be money. I keep saying this, okay? Because again, we need lecturers. If you come to my department in, uh, KNUST, we want lecturers, okay, because people with, um, in our area most often, um, there is so much work out there and they are well, well, well paid. And so people will not want to come. So usually I talk to them, say, hey, there is opening, we want lecturers. And anybody that asks me the question, what is the salary? My response is, don't come. Okay, <laughs> if you start with salary, I just tell you, don't come, because with salary, you will not be motivated. Okay, yes, there are other avenues that uh, God has created for us in the teaching field for us to also do well so that we'll not be poor people begging for money. Uh -huh. But then if your motivation is money, you will be disappointed. So don't move into the field because you want money. Um, it doesn't mean you, will not be on, you cannot be on the field and, and get money, but that shouldn't be your ultimate motivation. You should come with the motivation to impart knowledge, to transform young minds and to cause them to excel in society and to achieve the highest that you couldn't achieve. And um, that's one thing I always love. Things I wanted to do when I was a student that I couldn't do, I want to motivate my students to do. The highest I couldn't achieve, I want to motivate them to achieve. The schools I couldn't attend, maybe because of one or two limitations, I want to motivate them to attend. 
things I couldn't understand, I want to motivate them to understand. So that is what I think should guide you. But if you want money, don't come. <laughs> <laughs> That, that was a very good one, Dr. Poku. We'll take um, Mrs. Gatti's um, response to the question as well. So let me repeat it just for clarity. And wh wh why did you, what led you into this career? What was your motivation? And what would you tell those of us who also want to get into education to prioritize? Okay, I love what Dr. Opoku said. If you want money, don't come. <laughs> <laughs> for, me, for me, what led me into teaching was a call right from if like my youthful age, I knew that I was called to teach because I always found an opportunity to teach. Even after children's service, you know, for the Presby Church, you're supposed to graduate to junior youth. Yeah. But when I was done with that, I just told them I want to be a teacher. So I started teaching children's service rights at a young age. And along the line, there was a prophetic word to confirm the fact that mm -hmm no matter the heights to which I could get in life, whatever I had to do was to do with children. Mm. So I had to find a way. Like Dr. Poku said, I got jobs in other places that were working all right. I, I was getting salary, <laughs> but it got to the point there was no satisfaction, no fulfillment. You wake up every morning and it's like a chore to dress up for work. So at a point I just resigned, not knowing what to do, but just designed to ask God again where the path was leading. And then it led back to teaching. So for me, that was what brought me into education. And my passion was the fact that I could always be a blessing to somebody, to pour myself out into someone. Um, like um, a man of God or a pastor has a congregation on Sundays and during teaching services. But as a teacher, I have my congregation from Monday to Friday. They are always there with me. So I always have the opportunity to share my faith, my learning, everything that I have with the children. And for those who know me in the teaching field, the children I teach always stand out wherever we find ourselves because I don't just see it as a job to get money, but I see it as a call. So that has kept me all the way. So it makes me intentional with whatever I do in the teaching field. And for those who want to get into the teaching field, I would love to say that don't see it as a last resort. Like I've, I'm done with the university, I've applied for so many jobs, nothing is coming. So there's this private school near my house. <laughs> Let me just go and do something with them. And then with time, when the bigger door opens, I'll just run into it. Don't see it as a, um, a last resort or a second option. Check your passion. If it is not there, it is not there. Because teaching is a very difficult field to be in, especially when you're teaching at a lower stage or like teaching young ones like I do. It will take you a lot of effort. Somebody may just say something or do something that might push you to just quit or to just say, I wouldn't do it again. So if the passion is not there, and of course the salary too is not a motivation because you're not really getting anything like that other departments or other sectors are getting. So if the passion is not there, you're always a sad teacher, a moody teacher who is always whining, who is not giving his or her best because your passion and motivation is not there. So please check for passion before you make a step to be a teacher. Thank you. Wow. So this, 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 is, this, is, this is deep, you know, and, and I think we should take note of what she said concerning the fact that the pastor has his congregation or her congregation on Sundays, but as a teacher, she has a congregation from Monday to Friday. Wow. Wow. Thank you very much, Mrs. Gatti. Dr. Lante. All right, thank you very much. Um, what led me into this area of um, choice um, I remember I wanted to be a bilingual secretary. I loved the languages, French especially. And so when I got the opportunity into um, the university, I was, I was happy when I was offered um, French, linguistics, um, 
classics, philosophy. I was just happy because I had languages to do with. So um, I started off and I remember then you need to do your first year before you are um, you apply into the business school or to law. So you do your first year and depending on your GPA, which is your grade points, then you could apply. So my father visited me one day and then said, um, I've read in the newspapers that um, University of Ghana Business School is offering um, human resource management. And so um, I would like you to apply. Um, I wasn't happy with my father. And so it became a, a fight. So after a while, then she he, he told me, I know you want to do French. And so let me offer this as um, a top up. When you finish business school, I'll give you the opportunity to study French at Alliance Francais. So at Alliance Francais. So when he said that, I agreed with it because I wouldn't have to forgo my French. And so I can do business, which is a new offer and still top up with what I wanted to do. So I came, I, I applied to the business school, I got admitted and I started doing, um, studying human resource management. I loved it. It was beautiful. I enjoyed my classes. I enjoyed my um, 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 assignments. And I remember when I finished, I was posted to um, the district assembly at of Angkor area. And I went there and the administrator just looked at me and said, Mini Obanova here in Ichimo. Meaning, are you coming to take my job from me? I was lost by that comment. <laughs> and I wasn't taken for the national service. So I had to come back to the business school. And then I met my lecturer, one of my lecturers, and he said, oh, I need a teaching assistant. Um, come and work with me. So I became his teaching assistant. And, and then after school, I was recommended to, you know, those recruitment agencies, they will review your CV, invite you, interview you, and then post you off. And then I attended that interview with this recruitment agency. After the interview, the lady said, I want you to work with me. I won't let you go. I was surprised. And so I stayed there um, for one year. And then in the second year, I got a job. And so I left that place. And up to today, I will say that I am very happy. I listened to my father and um, I am enjoying my career. Uh, I don't know if I would have been this um, fulfilled or satisfied being a bilingual secretary. But as children of God, we should know that God uses several ways to speak to us. So he says, the Bible says that the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. So from my father was used, my teacher was used, my lecturer was used, um, the consultant was used, and then I launched out into full practice on my own. And so I would say that your mother or your father does not wish you ill, they direct, God uses them to direct us. I have had several issues where um, children or wards will fight their parents and decide not to come to school. But God uses says that he makes all things work together for our good. As long as you fit into his plan, he will knit it together. And then it becomes, you know, those beautiful colored um, ropes or fabric you see it and you see everything in it and you like it, right? So God actually ordered my steps. I knew I wanted to be a bilingual secretary. I didn't know why that came about. Probably I desired to speak French. And so I thought that if I become a bilingual secretary, I will have the opportunity to speak French fluently. When I see it on TV, I admire it. But my father redirected my steps. Even though he gave me the opportunity to enroll in the French school to study French, I don't know what happened to the money he paid or I paid afterwards. I don't know where the French passed. So I don't know how that would have turned up. But I would say that um, that motivation was a seed my father sowed and it germinated well. 
I took good care of it and it germinated well. God helped me. So I would say that for those who want to come into teaching, um, for teaching, I would say I picked up that trait very early. Just like Dr. Popu said, in school, I will explain um, um, lectures to my colleagues and they are surprised whether we all sat in the same class. I remember I was, I was, I was teaching, um, I was working in an international organization, a US-based NGO, and the CEO attempted to teach, I think some, you know, we have core values of organizations, attempted to explain it to the um, staff and it didn't go well. So I organized another training and I taught them and the CEO, the director told me, you have a gift of teaching. I remember when I was, um, 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 was a teaching assistant, um, I taught a subject for one of the teachers I wasn't assigned to because the students were finding his approach difficult. When I finished, one student commented and said, hey, who is this TA who can teach better than the lecturer, right? And so you, you put the pieces together and you realize that it is something in me I hadn't noticed. So gradually, when I finished, this same lecturer gave me his course to teach, and this was on... Um, with a big short class, like executives, right? And so he was afraid um, I would mess up. So after the class, he quickly um, checked with the students how it went. And they said, she's fantastic. So then putting the pieces together, I realized that, okay, this is something I can do well because I like the comments. I was enjoying the comments. And when I finished teaching, I noticed that I feel very happy. Mm. I feel very, very happy. When I finish teaching, I feel very happy inside. And so the lecturer told me, even why don't you join the department? I went off for one year and then I sent him an email. And I told him, um, is that offer still available? And then he said, bring your CV. And then he sent me the application document. So I believe that if you want to um, get into your profession, there are many, many young persons who do not know where they should go. Today, we have developed framework that we use to help them identify what they can do best based on their interest. But I tell you, there is nothing better than taking God's way or choosing God's way. You might not see it today in you, but God is seeing it in the end. How are you going to turn out? Um, Dr. Poku resigned from his jobs, even though they were good paying. Mrs. Gate didn't take those offers because they were good paying, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't want to go winding, winding. Others have been there. And today they are sharing with you how they arrived. So your, your path becomes shorter at arriving. So you don't go winding through the desert. So for um, the youth today who are listening and want to know where do I want to end, there is a career development program you can easily sign up to, quickly identify what you are good at or you can do, options of jobs that are related to it, and then you pray about it for God to confirm that this is where I want you to go. So this is my story about how I started off and how I ended. And I will say I am very satisfied today. Um, I agree with Dr. Poku. If you look at the basic salary, you will not do the job. But God gives us avenues for us not to be poor. I will quote him again. For us not to be poor, he makes sure that there is something else we can do to be able to keep family, pay the bills, and even buy the things, as for women, buy the things we desire so that we will stay happy in him. So God makes it work together. Stay in him. Do what you can do as a human being, right? As the individual. Learn, look at how you can identify your career. Which options do I want or I find pleasurable to, 
to, to pursue and take it to God for confirmation. If God says, I don't want you to do this, he will open the door where you should go to. Like Mrs. Gatte said, I just resigned. She resigned without knowing where to go. And then it came up. So mm -hmm. I think that we God speaks to us differently. My father was used. My teacher was used. Um, for some other people, they will go on a retreat and hear God. And other people will get prophecy like Mrs. Gatte. God knows how to speak to each person for us to hear him. After you have done what you have to do, listen, it is also important to listen to those who are in that field, mm. right? So for instance, uh, you want to be a teacher. I am a teacher. Dr. Gatte is a teacher. Ms. Uh, Dr. Pope is a teacher. Mrs. Gatte is a teacher. Speak to someone in the field to check if you really want to be close to that person or even better than that person. And then that will be helpful. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Lamte. And you've done all the summary for us as well on that, on that um, question. So I'll start with Mrs. Um, Gatte again. And this time we would hear from the ladies and then Dr. Okukutu will come in. So, um, so Mrs. Gatte and then Dr. Lamte will come back in and then Dr. Poku will cap it up for us. So the question really here is, how effective is Ghana's education system or curriculum for preparing students for real life. You know, there is a certain sense in which I believe that sometimes Ghanaians are a bit too quick to condemn what they have, even without having experienced what is out there for themselves. So if I saw Ghana's educational system is more, you know, theory than practical, but from you who are in the field, how effective is our curriculum, our system for preparing people for the real world, which is cutting. Thank you. Um, with the current educational system, I would side with what you said. It's more of theory than practical. So it's like the students are always looking at chewing for exams, pouring it out by writing and passing. So that is, I want to be an A student. I want to get it this way. We are less focused on the practical bit of it or getting us ready for the job market. So that is where we fall short as a nation with our curriculum. But I also feel that as an educationist, in your own small way, although the curriculum might be a straight jacket for you, you can make an impact by adding on other stuff that you feel might be needed or necessary. So for me, I may be in a school that tells me to teach A to Z. But as a Christian, I can find ways of integrating things I know about God into teaching math, the biblical perspective. I can find ways of putting it into science, into social studies. And then I am not limited in what I teach. Oh, okay, in quotes, I'm limited to what I have to teach. But in the classroom, I can add on. So I can add on grooming, personal grooming, you know, chipping one or two things, bringing children up in the house, you know, as a teacher. So if we as educationists become intentional with the teaching we do, despite the shortcomings or the shortfall in our educational curriculum, there can still be an impact made. If we go the extra mile or take our teaching a step further. So that is what I feel can be done. All right, so um, for, for the, um, let me just push back a bit on, on, on um, Mrs. Gatti still. Um, so in one sense, you, do you agree that our education system does not prepare us for the real world? Yes, I agree with that. That there's a okay. short point in that. All right, so what you're saying is that people should also add in the extras. They can also try the extras for themselves. Yes. Versus students. Are doing it versus students. Students could also chip in, like learn a little thing. Like one of the panelists said, education is now like on our fingertips. So you don't depend on the school to teach you everything. Mm. If it comes to mind, you can just, personally, when I get pregnant, 
I researched so much that once I went to the doctor and I already knew what he had to say. So he was like, why did you study medicine? I said, no, I didn't. I just read. You get it. So I feel that we should also make an effort to educate ourselves, not always depending mm. on the system to educate. Mm. Wow, this, this is very insightful. So the, the educationists themselves have to be intentional and the students themselves have to be intentional as well. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Lante. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I would say that the educational approach or the teaching approach in Ghana or in our institutions um, focuses on teaching the, uh, the, the theory, which are the principles. I call the theory the principles because um, you cannot just go and do it. You need to have some framework or basis to be able to do what you do. And um, this is what the um, books teach. So that is why we call it theory, because we teach the books. Um, it is important for us to know that um, we have to start from somewhere, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I wouldn't totally condemn, and I like your, your um, opening statement that we are quick to condemn. I wouldn't like us to condemn what we have because when our approach might not be excellent, but when Ghanaian students go out, they are unstoppable. Why? Because they have the basis that the Ghanaian educational system has provided and they are able to add on. I would agree that we are not able to um, teach the practice too well or uh, at the level we should be teaching it because um, for instance, I think um, not too long ago, employers, I read from um, some comment from employers stating that um, the graduates they are hiring are not able to do what they, the employers want them to do, right? And this is because we are not, the institutions are not partnering with industry so that we can feed the need of industry into the curriculum to be able to teach exactly what the business industry is looking for or the firms are looking for. So we teach them what are in the books and truly we are two, two different institutions and even one organization differs from the other. So if we are not getting the um, students to practice what they are learning in the class, it becomes difficult for them to just transfer the knowledge they have learned from the class right into business or into um, jobs because it doesn't link. What is not happening is that businesses are not also providing educational institutions the opportunity to um, um, have their students have internships. Some organizations won't even accept interns at all. How can we have our youth or our young persons learn what they have um, practiced, what they have learned, right? They have learned in the classroom. They have to be able to do it. And then when they get into the office, they know that, okay, I learned this theory, these are the principles. Okay, I apply it this way, but this particular one doesn't work. Then we'll be making progress. But if that doesn't happen, we will be able to teach the books which are available to us. And then when they get into the business, it will be the employer's responsibility to teach again. That is what will happen. So they will get the foundation in the classroom and the employer will have to teach them again, which means that they have to incur bills to be able to train them to do what they want them to do. So even though we are not teaching the practice, I would say that some organizations are also very helpful. They request for interns every now and then, even though they don't, it doesn't lead into permanent jobs after school, they give them the opportunity to come and push paper and understand that you report to this authority, you sign in, you sign out, you take permission. These are all sorts of things that the students will need to have. And so even though this is not happening, there are a few organizations that are helping. Some even offer to come into the lecture halls as guest lecturers. 
to come and explain how it is done in the industry. Even though they cannot take the interns, they come to the class to come and help explain to the students, this is what you are learning, this is how it works. And sometimes it doesn't even work at all. So which means then you need to figure out how to merge the knowledge and practice when you get there. Oh, wow. So thank you so much, um, Dr. Lamte. Uh, I'll move to Dr. Poko now. Yes, um, and I think I agree with the things they have said earlier. Um, but then let me also bring in this line. Um, most often when people talk about something is good or bad, it means they are measuring it against something, some standard. And most often what we do is we measure our education system against a standard which is the outside there, which some people have never been to, as she said. Um, and since you're outside, you agree with me that we, we condemn our education system and praise this. But when we move from here and we meet with their students, we are among the best. Okay. Um, and so that tells you that um, ours might not be a trash after all. Um, we might not be top there. We might not be the best. But it doesn't mean what we have is nothing. We shouldn't trash it. Talking about theory, and I love the way um, uh, Dr. Mrs. Yvonne puts it, um, that is principles. You see, depends on which level of education you are talking about. I'm an engineer, and when I'm teaching my students, I remember one time I, I taught students and I did all the design that I needed to do, take, him, take them through from a physical, physical system, um, how the, whatever we are doing relate to the physical system in designing or coming up with specification for the product you want to buy. Then I asked them, do you understand? Yes. Okay. So now you understand that our education system is not only theory. And they said, no, it's theory. I said, why are you saying it's theory? Then they said, because we did not go to the lab. You see, that is the misconception. Okay. Different education um, systems are targeted at different things. As an engineer, um, I can work as an engineer in the lab or in the office for it, sorry, without ever entering lab. And I'll still be a very successful engineer because engineer is involved in designing systems. Of course, our, our system is not there. In Ghana, most of the things are buy, install, um, maintain. So when that comes to play, then the role of engineer is pretty much reduced. So people see us as technicians. That's why they, there is this debate that, oh, people from polytechnics do well than the degree holders. Well, they do well because people from polytechnics and, and sometimes I teach at poly also, it's hands-on. Okay, they don't need to fully understand the concept. They just need, how, need to know how to hold the machines or the tools. They know how to install, they know how to do all those things. So they can, yes, they can move on to industry and integrate very quickly than myself, and I mean Ghana industry, because in Ghana industry, most of the things we do there don't involve the design and the use of the principle, direct application of the principle. So the problem we have is we are judging our education system first with a wrong standard, and then secondly, we are looking at um, something that is actually practical and calling it theory. So as an engineer, I don't need to hold a screw before I say I'm doing practicals. I can just sit in front of my computer and have engineer colleagues at some companies. All they do is um, they have a simulation tool, for example, in the power industry. And if the person is using um, a simulation tool to model the entire Ghana power system, and then look at what will happen if a transformer goes off, and then get back to the operations people and tell them we need to fix a line here and change this one here and make these changes at this point. Else when this transformer goes off, which is bound to happen in the near future, it can cause the entire nation to get a blackout. Now, he never held any screw driver and he never went to touch the transformer, but sitting in his room, he's done something very practical. 
Okay, mm -hmm. so the practical does not necessarily mean you are in the lab or you are having a hands-on and you are doing that. Yes, you need to be able to relate. I teach my students and how things work. It's one of the websites or the video sites I love to go to. Because I go to the, that place and I see animations of, um, I see electrons moving, okay? And then I see how current is generated. I get excited. So I can relate to things which are abstract. So I teach my students to use some animations from online and all that, which we didn't have the privilege of having. To have a feel of the, um, the way things are, um, abstract things actually happen. But at the end of the day, what we are teaching, I will not say it's purely theory, just that some people feel it's theory. Uh, recently, the information that generated a lot of heat when somebody said, what did I use the pi r square for? And what did I uh, use the Pythagoras theorem for? Interestingly, when he was doing the video, he was sitting in a car. Okay, and before that wheel could be modeled well, the pi r square was part of the wheel. Mm. Okay, before the steer can be turned for you to get the direction you want to go, that Pythagoras theorem and the pi r square had gone into the design of those steers. So he doesn't know that he's actually a beneficiary of the things he's condemning. <laughs> so he looks at it, oh, okay, if you had taught me how to use a screwdriver, I would have benefited because I will have to turn a screw. But he doesn't know that for us to even know how the screw can move in and out, we had to use the pi r square. So this is the problem we have, the relationship between the practical and the so-called principle or the theory. It's not established. So even when somebody is learning practical, they still can think they are doing actually theory because mm. they have some understanding of what they think is practical. So I think that must be corrected, yes. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dr. Poku. Let me just follow up quickly. Um, this misconception that people have, how can, we, how can we reorient our minds? You know, for me personally, I think that um, Ghanaians have to, for, I think it's a colonial kind of mentality where people think that everything that is from Ghana, originated in Ghana, operated by Ghanaians, is inferior in comparison to something that somebody you know, from outside or somebody from outside Ghana comes to do. That is my opinion. I could be wrong, but I believe the misconception you are calling out here today. How can we really correct this misconception? Aside maybe the education and the desire coming, I think it will take generations for Ghanaians to come to really believe in what we have. You know, for instance, I mean, let, let me be a bit controversial. We have Kantanka cars and people are making all sort of funny noises about them. People laugh at them. But you see, Tata started in India and Tata, even now, Kantanka cars by, you are an engineer, so you know. If you look at the, the design, you know, you look at how it's, the dimensions look or the, it, it's, I think Kantanka cars actually look nicer than Tata. And Tata started like Kantanka. But because Kantanka started in Ghana, we will laugh at ourselves. But Tata is being produced in some Indian village and brought to our people and then, you know, no disrespect to my Indian friends who'll be watching yeah. me later, but, you know, how can we correct some of these misconceptions for me? I mean, yes. not to the next question. Okay, so again, one of the things I highlighted when I was talking earlier was that I point students to go and watch animations and understand for them to understand the things we are talking about and how they work. Because most of you, we might not have all the um, the tools to demonstrate in the class. And also, um, as my colleagues might bear witness to, we are talking about large classes now, you know. Um, out there, when they say large class, they are talking about 50 students, okay. Here, when we talk about large class, some are talking about 500 students, okay. And you, so you are limited in all the demonstrations you can do and how to relate to individual students. What can I do to help? the situation. I love to get people from industry, okay, to help. So if you come to our place, um, currently I'm the coordinator for industrial presentations. So we get people from industry, they come, they meet with a session of students of interest and they show them how the things they are doing is being applied in industry. And one of the company, oil companies, they come, they, how to design a rig. 
um, what we, they, they show them all of that practical examples they have done and, and how it was implemented. So that is one key way, getting the industry, as she said, to interface with the students and tell them that after all, what they are learning is not useless. It can be used. Another way is to get um, students internship. And um, I'm also part of the internship or industrial training um, team. So we try to get a students. In fact, this year we have a big problem um, because as part of our training, you need at least six to eight months. I think it's about six months minimum of industrial training. It's eight months, but because of limitation, um, eight weeks, sorry, because of competition for slots, we sometimes give six weeks before you can graduate. So when you finish your third year, you need to go for that industrial training before you can graduate, which is a way to get the students to interface with industry and learn from the industry. So that is a good thing. This year, we didn't get that because of the COVID. So students who were placed in industry, the industry wrote to us and said, we can't accept them anymore because of COVID. So what do we do? Do we throw our hands in the air? No. So we came up with innovative ways. Well, what is the main idea behind the industrial training? The main idea is for the students to know what goes on in industry, to uh, obtain some form of mentorship and to be able to integrate very easily into industry. So what we came up with was to get um, mentors for them. So now we are getting people from industry to take them through about three weeks of mentorship. And we have outlined the type of skills and the things they need to know. And where even they can have physical interaction with the person, we want the person to go. So all these things, industrial mentorship for the students who are about to graduate is also another way, okay? We are also think, looking into ways of getting people from industry to come up with project topics that the students can embark on and then getting them to be co-advisors on the project so that when it comes to reporting and all that, they can get them to do it based on industrial standard. So these are all things we are trying to put in place for the students to be able to um, learn um, the other skills which might not explicitly be defined in the curriculum, but still be helpful to them when they are integrating into the outside world. So that is how we can rescue the street. The changing of the mindset um, you might know that in US, um, uh, condo is expensive than rice, okay? And when you come to Ghana, rice is uh, 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 way expensive than condo. So uh, it depends on where you are and our mindset, that one I think is challenging. Again, that's why education is important. Whilst you have them, you try to change their mindset. Uh -huh. So that like um, um, Mrs. Uh, Gatti said, you can be pumping that in subtly. So as they are taking all the things you are teaching them, it will be entering into their subconscious. So that after some time, maybe they will wake up. And for me, frankly, uh, I think I'm awake to a lot of these things. Um, I would rather buy condo than to buy rice because it's coming from outside, okay? Because I know that what we have is actually valuable. I have the saying I tell people, most often we wrap our gold in trash so that people can buy it as trash. Whilst mm. outside they, they, wrap, they wrap their trash in gold so that they can sell it to us as gold. So we need to wake up to these things so that we can also package and present what we have. And before you can do that, you have to love it yourself and know the value. Because if you don't know the value of something, you can never ever sell it to somebody as valuable. Thank you. Well, that that's that was really insightful, Dr. Opoko. Really appreciate it. So, um, part of the solutions we must be intentional. Mrs. Gatte said, Dr. Lanto also told us that partnership is needed in ensuring in that between industry and the educational institutions, in ensuring that we get the practical aspect of education. And Dr. Opoko, thank you also for your um, enlightening enlightenment on misconceptions in the educational system. So I'll. I'll just ask them, um, this goes to the panel, and what, what really, which, in which areas, looking at the educational system in Ghana, um, in which areas can, can Christians really influence? And if you are going to advise um, Christians on which areas you think need 
are in need and people should come in and how they could influence society? Which areas would you recommend in which areas? I can start with Dr. Lamte. All right, so um, thank you very much. It is important to know that as long as you mention society, it means that um, it, it, it has components, right? It has components. And so if we want to influence society, it means that we need to do it in all angles because we, we are building a holistic um, society. We cannot be good on one and then be um, poor on the other. So if we need to build society and I need to invite or involve people to be, it has to be everywhere. For us to be able to become good Christians, we need to know the word of God and know his principles and know what he requires us to do. If we need to do business, we need to know um, business management. If we need to be engineers, we need to learn engineering. If we need to be educators, or um, we need to know how to teach, right? And we can't do one and leave the other. It has to be done together. So if you are, we, we need to know how, um, we can build society, we need to build society um, all around. And this brings me to the fact that um, we will notice, we will notice that even though we are um, in education, we do other things, right? Dr. Poku mentioned that we do other things to be able to make money um, appreciably, to be able to foot bills and so that we don't feel poor. We also need to know that um, we need to be able to influence what we do positively. So if I need to influence my society, I need to know what I can do well. So I then know that, okay, I am a teacher. I am gifted at teaching. What can I do to improve society? So apart from taking on my secular job as a teacher in a business school, I also know that I can teach the word of God and with the youth, which I do, I can teach adults the principles of God and how that can be applied. The beautiful thing is that as you grow, as you develop, as you learn, you are able to understand and apply the word of God practically in some ways. And so you are able to promote that discourse so that, um, Church does not look like we read the word of God, we get out, and as the parable says, we forget the man in the mirror. So we need to read the word of God. We need to understand how it applies in the secular job we are doing. Then we'll be able to influence society. So in influencing society, we don't just do it by um, in one way. There are different ways we can influence society. And I also have a passion for evangelism because of my um, gift to teach. So if we need to influence society, we need to do it understanding how God wants us to influence society. So for instance, we know that if I need to um, influence society, influence someone, what would the person be looking out for? So we have something we call presence evangelism. We are looking at, okay, um, the person is looking at me as a Bible, right? So Bible tells us that I am an epistle. So I am being read by others. So they are looking at how I move, how I talk, how I manage my anger, my attitude towards the work I am doing. And so they want to see that this is consistent with what I stand for, what I believe in, the name of Jesus that I am calling. And then when they find it beautiful, then they will say that, oh, this person is actually a Christian, right? Others, when others are doing things in the, in the workplace, what do you do to make sure that, okay, um, you are helping out? So apart from the fact that you are being read, you are being seen, you are being observed, they are also looking at what you do, which are your actions. And so we also need social action. We need to help. We need to support. 
sometimes you know that um, this person is messing up with a particular assignment or with something to do. Instead of um, joining others to probably talk behind the colleague's back, you offer to help the colleague out. It is not as easy as I am saying it, especially from where I am coming from, because you can't easily walk to somebody, for instance, Dr. Poku would um, identify with that or Mrs. Gatte. You can't easily walk to another teacher and say, um, would you need help with this one? Then the question is, I am, am I bad at it? And why do you want to help? But you can find ways to support the other person. And immediately that action is accepted, then you realize that the person finds a friend in you. So you realize that you influence the person with the love that God has shown in your heart. And sometimes you also go ahead to actually tell people, then you mention to them that this is what I do to go past this situation. Some people get angry and mess up badly, right? As a child of God, what is your tool for managing anger? So if you realize that somebody else is getting angry and messing up, you could tell the person how you manage anger. What biblical principles do you apply in your life to manage that anger? Then you tell the person about it. Do that, the person, if the person doesn't know Christ or doesn't know how to apply it or probably reads the Bible but doesn't know how it translates into actions, the person learns from you. And gradually we win the people over. Sometimes if you are daring enough in our present world, um, you decide to over, offer probably a Bible discussion, right? And then you learn some basic life principles you can share with um, your colleagues for them to, um, this other person, for the person to also learn to do how it is done. And I would say that the Bible has a lot of principles or um, frameworks we can learn from. And from the day I learned, I started learning that I have found a lot Bible more interesting to read. So for instance, um, some people would sit on the work and um, Dr. Foku will identify with me on this one. Um, some um, heads or some colleagues will get projects. They won't call anybody. They want to do everything by themselves. And by the time they realize they couldn't meet the deadline, right? And so then instead of spreading it out, for everybody else to take a bit and pitch in for the project to work, you have lost it yourself. And you didn't give the others the opportunity to, so that at least you could get a word of love or encouragement from another person. And when I look at how Jethro guided Moses on how to delegate jobs, it is beautiful, right? So these are principles we can learn so when we equip ourselves with these principles in the word of God, we pass them on. And typically the comments you will get is, hey, how did you know? How did you do it? Then that takes you to the Bible. Oh, come, let me show you. You open the word of God and it is there. You read it together, you explain it together, and then you have influenced one person. The other person will tell somebody else about it. The person will come and find out. And so it is not as difficult as we find it. We think that um, if we need to make an influence as Christians, how do we do it? It has to be practical. We need to make sure that the word of God is speaking in our lives, at the workplace, at the church, in the market so that others will by themselves, like the woman at the well, come and see. Then the others will come and see. Sometimes it is not as easy as you talk about. Uh, we, we, we talk about it or I describe it. Sometimes it gets difficult. This is somebody who is not nice, who is very argumentative. You know you can't win an argument with this person. What do you do? You know, if you, even if you offer to help, you are in trouble. It means that you are, you are calling me a bad person. I am not good enough. You are mm. superior. 
you are coming to brag or right it becomes difficult in that situation you resort to prayer because god is the only person who can touch a heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh so that mm -hmm. you can have that opportunity to also touch that life so i believe that if we need to influence society we need to make sure that our lives are speaking to it bible is practical and others can apply it when they don't have answers or solutions and then we'll be making a way thank you so much dr lamte and um i'll just i'll just ask um mrs gatte and dr Opoku this last question and um so in in your in your experience and in your um, classrooms or your space class spaces with with the secularization of education where some institutions are not interested in getting um formally getting christian principles taught in classroom um how do we how do we as christians propagate the faith or the gospel in these settings so um the mrs gatti and dr Poku can answer i think dr lamte touched on that from a um, experience and perspective I want to hear your perspective on that as well. Okay, so as um, an educationist or as a teacher, like you're saying, some schools don't really allow you to add the God factor to the lessons. But I said earlier on that once you are intentional and determined to make an impact, the Holy Spirit always gives us ideas as to how to inculcate our faith into our teaching. It, 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 it wouldn't come naturally. You would have to make an effort. You would have to ask him for help. How do I go about it? How do I bring this into my teaching so that in the end, I point the children to God or I point my listeners to the faith? I couldn't have agreed with Dr. Lamte more because our lives should be the greatest teacher or pointer to what we do. And like she said, it doesn't come easy. At a point you become the, the, the hated one. Mm. And everyone is like, you think you know better than us. At the place where I was working, working with expats and all that. And then at a point the comments were like, you were Ghanaian, you think you know better than the white people. So you are tagged or hated. So if you don't have that determination to move on, you may quit because of the pressure coming your way. So you just have to be intentional about it. Just ask Holy Spirit for ideas. Like Dr. Lamte said, the Bible has it all. It will just come in your preparation of the lesson and all that. He would give you ideas and ways in which you can bring your faith into your teaching. So it all, you shouldn't detach your faith from your career or what you are doing. Don't think mm. God is, in church or in my house with me and my teaching mm. is another let everything that you do you said all things work together so it means in everything that you do it must all be one holistic thing that you're doing so um let, let me let me follow up how, how did eyo prepare you for this how did eyo contribute to your own um endeavors or the response you had in your your career this okay, kind of i joined eyo right after secondary school. So before mm. I came to the university, I was a member of EYO. And EYO did a fantastic job by grooming us on campus. We were known as the ladies with long skirts. We're <laughs> always wearing long skirts to, to you know, cover everywhere. And we were, how do I say the, the, the We were intentional about the way we lived. Mm. You know, when you come to campus, you always want to explore, want to do what others are doing. But because of the, the foundation that I had after secondary school, before I got to the university, it was like it was a preparatory ground. So it just mm -hmm. helped me to keep my track, or to keep on track and to stay focused. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very influential in me staying on track throughout my first degree. EYO was very, very influential. Oh, we, we thank God for with outreach and um, Dr. Popo, Dr. Poku. So, um, how how would you propagate the faith in 
an atmosphere or an institution where there's a lot of secularization and or even institutions which are which in their charters are secular institutions? Well, again, like they highlighted earlier, I think um, it, it comes across from your lifestyle, from your deeds and from your words. So all of them are supposed to work together in propagating the gospel. Your lifestyle, the things you do, how you relate to people, how you respond to people. Um, I always talk about the, there was a time I had, I said something and um, a friend or a, a workmate who is older than me, it just came out of an insult just appeared from his mouth. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what will you do? I just started laughing. Then he said, Said you be the any, okay. What will happen has happened, <laughs> you know. Like, you see that is something that um, he does, but he wouldn't have used it on me. But my response also made what he did actually of no effect because you said an ins I mean plain insulting words, and I'm laughing, okay. Mm -hmm. Because what I did, I've not done anything wrong, so I was laughing. And then he said, "Said you be the any," and then we ended up relating again. Um, I, I had the same, um, I had a, a strong disagreement with the same person, he's older than me, and uh, on the phone, and when he was, somebody will be angry and just shone away, okay, but then um, I asked where he was, and he was moving to the department office, and I also walked to the department office, when I met him, the first thing was a smile, and it was laughter, then I said, ah, why are you taking this line? And he, K -k -k -k. but then at the end of the day, we made peace there before I let him leave. Okay, I don't have to hold anything against you as a coworker. So I'll laugh. Even if what you are saying is not, I don't support you, we are laughing. Okay, I'll present my point, we go. Then um, another, let me end by saying this also, you know, as John Wesley said, the world is his parish and I believe my school or my students is my parish. So I need to also impact Christianity, but I can't take, uh, it would be very wrong to go and stand in front of the class using my lecture hours and preach to the student. Now, whilst I'm teaching, especially I try to pump, punch in some of these uh, apologetics Okay, I remember one time I was teaching them about stability. And we, we have, if, if I can find just one pole, okay, people might not understand that, but if I can find just one pole in a system, even if I have 100 poles, and I find one pole which is unstable, I can conclude that the thing is unstable, okay? But if I want to know whether the thing is stable, I have to know that all the poles are stable before I can conclude the thing is stable. And then whenever I teach that concept, I pass it on to the student. That is why it sounds very stupid to say there is no God. Because for me to say there is God, I need to find just one evidence that there is God. But for me to say there is no God, I have to have complete knowledge of the entire universe, which you don't have. Mm -hmm. So nobody can conclude, even if you know 99.9, the 0.1% uh, you don't know might be the one percent that God is in, mm -hmm. okay? so. I keep, whenever I get there, some, I have all these lines that when I'm teaching and I get there, I throw it at them and I, I just forget about it, okay? And I start teaching. And then sometimes it will strike the mind of somebody to start thinking about something they've not thought about. Lastly, open your hands to the students, okay? Um, for teachers, we are, not, um, we are not the rich person out there, but one thing I love and I thank God for is we are rich because we are able to use even the limited resource we have to make great impact. Okay, mm. I went through school uh, facing financial challenges. So I see students facing the same thing. If you are there, a student walk into your office. There's one student that walked into my office for me to approve um, his letter that he was using to apply for scholarship. So I read the letter. And then the student said there were times that I can even live on leptin and water for one week. And I said, how? When I stand in class, I tell you guys, if it's only food you eat, you come, okay? I will share what I'm eating with you because we ate gari so that you cannot be living here also eating gari. At least you can eat rice, see? So 
you, you tell them, but they don't believe it. So this student walks into my office and before he will leave, I don't just give him the letter that I've signed, but I give him something also to help him to keep up. Then he became one of my sons in school. You know, mm. and then one time I even didn't know that after secondary school, um, he went into some type of life, lifestyle. But he comes to your office, he's weeping, and then he's pouring his heart out. He's seeing all the mistakes he's made. And then he's telling you, I wish I had not gone this way. And they tell him, no, 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 no. Forget about what is past. We can move on from here. So it creates the avenue for you to impact Christianity to that today. Even though he's been going to church, he is now seeing a different aspect of Christianity. There's one student I did so much good with, and you know, especially when they are females, and you you do good to a female. Sometimes there were one student sat in my office after everything and asked me the question. Tell me what I told you want me to do in paying you back. I said, I want you to study and excel. That is mm -hmm. what I want you to do. That's what I want to see. Hello. I think, I think Dr. Um, Opoku has gone off a bit and we thank him for his contribution. His point was even well made before the line froze a bit. And um, so I'll just thank you so much to all the panelists. I want us to move to questions from the participants. And then th there's a question. There's a, there's a question. Okay. Dr. Poco, yes. you off a bit. Yes, yes and, I'm back. Okay. Uh -huh. so, so that that is an avenue to impact also. When you open your hands to the students, and especially when they are very um, in need and they come in, you open your doors, you are able to speak to them at a level they can easily accept and understand because they can feel the Christianity in you. Thank mm. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And so we'll move to the questions from the participants. There's a question. So I want to encourage everybody, if you have a question, everyone listening um, in or watching, if you have a question, please go to the Q and A and type your question, and you can even direct it to the particular panelists you want to answer. And um, so we'll move to the question. Someone put a question in the chat. Um, so the person wants to know: How do we balance the reality of our limitations um, in in our part of the world, in our educational system, with the advances and the extensive quality of the same in the more advanced countries. So the person wants to know that the person is saying that in reality, the, the limitations in our system in terms of the quality and advancements and us in comparison with those of say, the UK, the United States, some of the more advanced countries, how do we balance these realities? I don't know if the question is clear. Any other panelists who- yeah. okay. So I, okay. the first thing is, yeah, what I would say is, aside all that we are getting from our educational system, like I said initially, we also have to take responsibility for our learning, not to depend solely on the systems to provide everything that we need. So we should also take it upon ourselves to read outside the box or outside the subjects that we have decided to, um, how do I say it? Further educations or whatever in. You can always read. Let's keep reading. Let's keep learning something new. So that when you are given the opportunity, you will be prepared. And um, like Dr. Bogus said, stop, you know, dwelling on the fact that our educational system is of lesser quality or whatever. Let's just also add on with our little education of ourselves. So let's keep reading, reading, and learning or taking up little short courses, certificate courses, you yeah. know, anytime something comes up, you know, once a while I do a, a child psychology, a short course on this, a little bit leaders of learning, short, short courses to better ourselves than to just depend on the educational system. Thank you. Okay, right. I think to... Shad, Doc, please go on. Yeah, you oh, go okay. I, I think just to add to that, um, Thank God for technology. Okay, you can you can be learning from 
MIT coursework, you can be learning from Coursera, from edX, from Udemy, um, Udacity, all kinds of MOOC um, uh, course, uh, online courses. And you use all these things to gain what you cannot gain from our education system. Now, to sit down and only take what, especially when you are undergraduate, to take only what we are teaching you means you are, sorry to say, maybe becoming a lazy student, okay? Because I keep telling my students, it used to be that we teach students what to know, but actually now we just teach you how to know. Okay, so we point you to all the places you can get the information and we give you the, the, the foundation that helps you to be able to process the vast knowledge that is available on the internet, from journals, from books and all that. And then with that alone, you will be very good. I do app development. I never did it in school, okay? I just learn it on my own. So look at the current trend. Where is society moving to? I tell my students, for example, those in the, and um, Miss um, uh, Yvonne my understand this, that if somebody is in business school now and they might not know how to use even Microsoft Word and Excel and those things. And then the person starts and say, because we did it, they didn't teach us in school. I mean, what are you talking about? Who should come and teach you that? This is a fundamental, using computer used to be taught. Using computer is fundamental now. My, my, our mothers and others went to school saying they are doing secretariat and all they were learning was how to type, right? Now, I've never learned how to type, but by way of using, I can, I can type without looking at the keys and I can still type fast. Okay, the reason is simply because by, it's a skill, fundamental skill, like the way you are writing, so you need to know it. So you need to learn some of these things on your own to stay relevant in our society. Else you will go for interview or others and the questions they will ask you will have nothing to do with the theory because everybody coming there knows the theory. The add on might set you apart. So please don't focus only on what you are being taught because you have the internet available and all. I tell, I tell um, my students that there are people on YouTube who can teach what I'm teaching you even better than I do, okay? Mm -hmm. And then also there are people there who love to teach people. So open up, let them teach you. Go to um, Khan Academy and take a course, okay? I went online and I took microeconomics, an introduction to microeconomics it has nothing to do with in my engineering to the best of my knowledge, but I took it and I understood society. Okay, I started macro, but it was too complex, so I stopped. <laughs> you know, so learn something from another place. Learn something that will make you relevant in society and don't limit yourself to what you are being taught in classroom because we, we are giving just that much. 12 weeks and I'm spending two to three hours with you every week, it is not enough to do anything. Mm. Okay, but I, you can go online and I keep saying, when you don't want, you don't like, or you didn't understand what I'm teaching, you cannot say, say, go back 15 minutes. I won't do it. But once you pull that from the internet, you can even let them repeat themselves 20 times and they will never be angry. So you have the resources at your fingertips, use them. Um, Dr. Mrs. Yvonne Lante. Sure. Um, what I think um, young people should bear in mind today is that if you can't excel here, you are likely not to excel outside. Mm. Yes. So you need to make sure that even what we are calling not good enough, not what we are expecting or we are looking for, not the standard, make sure you can master it. Mm. So if it is just theory, just make sure you have the theories at your fingertips. Mm. So that when you have the opportunity, you don't have to struggle with the theory because you have mastered it. And if you cannot do it here, remember when you go outside, you will struggle. It is not just with what you do, it is also about relating to the people. 
you need to learn the dynamics of relating at work, relating with your lecturers, relating with adults, relating in society, because it is not different than when you go there, you have peers. Don't you have peers here? You do. When you go out there, you have supervisors or managers or lecturers. Don't you have those here? You do. When you go out there and you think, um, you can only excel mm -hmm. when you go to a university mm -hmm. abroad, which might not happen now, I will say that break that thought and mentality. Take what is within your reach, master it, so that you will have a ground or basis to build on when you find yourself in the environment you desire. Mm -hmm. It is not all bad here. I have had colleagues who left right after degree, they went out, they came back, they couldn't fit in because we have all their, we are their colleagues, we've moved on, we've become professionals, we are established, we are settled, we are happy with what we are doing. They come and they realize that, I think I want to go back because they cannot catch up. So I will advise that do not think that grass is greener at somebody else's feet. Mm. It is very green at your feet. Enjoy it as you can. And when the opportunity comes for you to advance and move on, you realize that you have no regrets at all. All right. Thank you so much. And um, be because of um, time, I think I would now point the questions to um, Preston so that we can we can have as many questions asked as possible. Somebody is asking that much of the, okay, it's been answered by Dr. Poku. So I'll just um, look at the other question in the chat. Um, the person wants to find out um, in the context of break, camp and advance, where do we set the boundaries in being too comfortable within our educational system? vis-a-vis -vis where we build it to become. So in the, I don't know if the question is clear. They said in, the, in that context, so um, of break camp and advance, where do we set the boundaries in being too comfortable within our educational system vis-a-vis um, -vis where we build it to become? Should we accept it as it is or should we, should we strive to build something um, which which is better than what we have, you know, where do we set the boundaries for being too comfortable? Well, Mrs. Gatte, would you want to take that? Okay. I think that um, one, as Christians, the first step is to pray for our educational system. How many of us have taken time? We're always praying for the president, the vice, the ministers, but I don't know if it, it's, it has ever crossed our mind, so it has been an issue of concern. Because whatever decision is made there, if it will not affect you today, it would affect your child or your grandchildren. So as Christians, if you want, to, want it to be, we should pray to God for leaders in that sector who understand what education is, who understand where they want to see an educational system get to. And then that will be the basis for which policies will be made. Because one thing I have noticed is every government comes up and then they have their own idea of policies they want to implement in the education sector. But if we have godly leaders and hopefully with our colleagues or superiors who want to go into politics, we will pray for you to be there so that when you get there, God will use you to establish principles and policies that would go a long way to affect our children. So aside prayer, we cannot go and change the system on our own because we find ourselves working under authority. So what we can do, like I said initially, in our own small way, try to push it to where we want it to become, to help in our own small way, aside prayer. Thank you. Right. That's um, thank you so much for for that answer. And um, I want to encourage all those on YouTube and on Facebook. You can also still ask your questions, and the the questions will be redirected to us here. We can answer them. And um, Dr. Poku, you did answer 
the question, but I would like you to just speak briefly also to the question in the Q&A. The person wanted to know that so far we've spoken about um, Christian teachers in the education system and what do we say about Christian students in terms of their peers also in influencing the system? Well, again, like I said, similar things are, are applied to students through your lifestyle, through your deeds, and through your words. You should be able to impact your um, colleagues and even your teachers, okay? And when I was in US, one of the things that brought tears to my eyes was the day I was in church and my supervisor walked into the church. He's a Muslim with a wife. And um, I was shocked. And so when he got to introduction section, um, they came in front and, and he said, well, I'm with Daniel and he's one of the best students I've had. And he, I, I love Daniel and, and I see that he always come to church. So I want to come and find what is here that wow. he, he's been coming. And the whole church was like, wow. And he never even told me and I never even invited him to church, but I found him there. So I was shocked, frankly. Why? Because he saw something in me. Um, as a student on campus, yes, um, especially in what, when we were here, like you asked the question first, what did EYO do? I think one thing that EYO, EYO offered that all the other fellowships were not offering, okay, was an atmosphere where no matter how stressed you are, you just come into this relaxed atmosphere where you can pour your heart out and you can share your struggles with people and you can interact with them like real human beings, not superhuman beings. Okay, because we were in fellowships and you meet people and they are super spiritual. And you meet EYO, and I don't know, I'm talking about spiritual in quotes. You meet EYO, you meet real people, okay, who will just relate to you at a level that makes you not feel like you are the Satan and they are God, you know. So the relaxed atmosphere to come and pour everything out. As a student, you can also create that atmosphere for your colleagues, okay? You can be involved in some student fellowships where your desire is not yemi okay? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But you are there as a real human being where you can impact the lives of people. And then when you have the chance, you know, I remember on my um, campus in US, were there when they called all the, we had united as student organizational leaders. I was working with one fellowship, um, Bethel Campus Fellowship, um, it's interdenominational, non-denominational campus ministry across US, Canada. They have branches in Nigeria and um, in uh, UK. And then we, we, they called us together and this guy came and they said they want to establish a ministry called um, accepted without restriction or something like that. And I met him, okay, so he, they said, okay, you want to join, you have to join the um, student leadership, um, student uh, Christian leadership on campus. So they brought him, we were in a room. And basically he's trying to say, well, they are gay church that is coming into the community and they want to establish their fellowship on campus. And then they said, okay, they should come and join us. And he thinks we should welcome them because we are the same. And I said, no, we are not the same. He said, well, we use the same Bible. I said, well, we are not reading the Bible the same way. So he came with grace and I went in with scripture. So um, the others were cowards, quote unquote, sorry to use, because to them, they have been taught to believe from their society, accept everything. And from where I'm coming from, I said, no, 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 no. We cannot accept until you are are based on the biblical principle. So we had some face off and after that people were like, Daniel, you should have maybe, and I said, no, no, don't tell me to shut up because Paul didn't do that. And as a Christian, I shouldn't do that. So there you get, when you get such platform, you also talk to people and relate to them. That is the worst. When you get a platform to also um, use your deed, you use your deed. And when you have to use your lifestyle, people, are copying. I tell my students, okay, everybody is copying, but you say you will not copy. Why? 
People will ask you, why are you not copying? Well, I'm not copying because it's against my Christian principles. When I was a TA and a Nigerian, um, sorry, I shouldn't have mentioned their nationality, but. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when I was a TA and a student approached me to buy Max for his missing, okay? Um, and I said, no, I can't do that. I can devote my entire time to teach you to make sure you pass the exams. He said, that's not he's looking for. He just want to, me to give him marks because I'm the one who is recording the continuous assessment and whatever I want, he will give to me. I said, well, I can't do that. Say, why can't you do that? So because it's against my Christian principles. Then he said, well, I'm also a Christian. So, you know, that's why we should help ourselves, you know. Now, so if you want to talk about that, you meet me another time. Okay, right now I'm going to my supervisor's place. Meet me another time. We'll talk about Christians and why we shouldn't do what we are talking about. Then when he left, he didn't come again. Okay, so I'm sure he's there thinking, I'm a Christian, why will I do this? And another Christian will not do it. So I've sowed a seed. It might not germinate instantly, but it might germinate sometime. So use every opportunity to plant some seed and leave it and watch, as Paul said, watch another person water it somewhere and watch God bring the increase. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Opoko. Um, I think we'll take, we are running out of time, so I'll just quickly, maybe in a minute, um, these two questions. Dr. Lamte, um, someone is saying that, what are the implications of the COVID-19 crisis on the, um, on the gap between learning outcomes of developed countries and developing countries? Someone is asking that. Um. Mm, okay, so briefly, uh, what I would say is that um, right now the mood is the same. They've gone virtual, Ghanaian, educational institutions have also gone virtual. Mm -hmm. The outcome is um, if you need, if you need to be able to do it right, you need to make sure that you also invest. So sometimes you are teaching and a student goes off and says, oh doc, my um, um, internet connectivity is gone off. I am not waiting. And in the same way that uh, a faculty person in the developed country is also not waiting is teaching, is moving ahead. So to be able to bridge the gap, make sure that you are investing in the facilities that can help you to cope or catch up. And that is in relation to the topic is internet. Make sure you are investing in internet. I keep telling my students, you can't bundle five CDs data and think that you have good connectivity. You should budget <laughs> for the month. Bundle data for the month is the cheapest way to go. If you bundle five CDs, it just runs out like nothing had happened. But if you have a budget, instead of using the money to do something, you set some aside to make sure that you have stable internet and you can stay on and use it to do what you have to do. I think that the outcomes will not necessarily be too different as long as you have the... Um, infrastructure to be able to catch up because now everybody is gone virtual. Mm -hmm. I know some some students who are supposed to fly out to school. Their school is saying we've gone virtual, stay in your country and learn. Ghana is saying very soon University of Ghana is going to reopen and I am sure that if COVID is not lifted, we are going to go continue being virtual. We ended the last semester or with virtual learning, virtual exam, virtual everything. You have students who will say, Doug, I thought I emailed my work, but <laughs> I realized that it didn't come because I didn't have internet connectivity. Your outcomes will be the same as the one in the developed country if you don't build the basic infrastructure that you need. All right, thank you so much. And I know the time is up, but I want to really ask this question. And so in one minute, um, Mrs. Gatti, um, I know you are into education policy and all that. So do we need to get into politics to influence our education system? Um, on the larger scale or in the bigger picture, we need some Christians, uh, Christian educationists there to make lasting policies. Okay. All right, thank you so much. And the longer answer Dr. Poku has also provided for the person who asked the question. Thank you so much, our panelists. Um, my name is Michael Apriku. I've been your moderator, and this has been Stride. 
and we've been talking about staying relevant in the real world, influencing the seven pillars of society. And today was education. We had wonderful conversations with Dr. Mrs. Yvonne Ayeki Lamte and Mrs. Linda Enimagate and Dr. Daniel Opoku. At this point, I will pass on the mantle to the anniversary committee for the closing prayer and announcements. Thank you so much for to our listeners and our audience on Facebook, YouTube, and in Zoom as well. We really appreciate you. Thank you and God bless you. God bless you too. Thank you very much, Mr. Michael Apreku, Dr. Mrs. Yvonne Lamte, Dr. Daniel Opoku, and Mrs. Lim, Linda Animagate. It's been a wonderful session. Um, I just come your way to bring you a few announcements. So the next episode of Stride is going to happen on 20th September on the Pillar of Family. So kindly mark your calendars and then join us for the next episode of Stride happening on 20th September. So EYO is 25 years old and we are celebrating God's faithfulness and the impact he's made through, through this ministry. Um, we'll be we are having a number of activities in the year. Um, the next one is happening on in October, which is our National Youth Week. It's a time of renewal, revival, and restoration. It's happening in October, 17th, October, 2020. There will also be a mega camp in December. That is our international youth and leadership camp and also worship camp happening in December. We, we are having weekly prayers, um, prayer posts going on our various pages. So kindly join us and pray with us. Um, we are also inviting you to partner with us. There, there, there are links being posted in the, in the chats and on the um, YouTube channels. So kindly follow the links and then give a birthday present to EYU in the form of cash, or you can call the numbers and support it, whatever you want to. So thank you very much and God bless you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this time we've had... Um, listening to these, these seasoned um, women and gentlemen share about education um, as a pillar of society. We thank you for the knowledge we've gained and the wisdom they've shared with us. We pray, Lord, that even as we proceed, um, you will help us be educationists ourselves, that we will teach the people that, will come, that we will come into contact with, and then you will help us to be influences wherever we find ourselves. May you be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, thank you so much for joining us and for viewing this edition of the program for the celebration of Excellent Youth Outreach. If you want to be a partner, please contact the number on the screen. If you also want to have EYO in the campus that you, are, you find yourself in, in Ghana, contact that number below. If you also want to have EYO in the country from where you are watching this, please contact this number also below. And I tell you, we would be ready and apt to listen to your needs and come to your aid. We want many young people to be blessed and want you to come along and help us be that blessing to this generation. God bless you so much.
and are being blessed by the Ministry of Excellent Youth Outreach. I encourage you to support us or be a partner by filling the form in the description. God bless you. Hello, thank you so much for joining 